Welcome back nerds, today we're going to build an easy circuit that lets you read the condition of a device at a glance without the need to fondle the equipment. Strap in ladies and gentlemen because it's time to get nerdy. Repairs and maintenance are some of the fundamental game mechanics of Barotrauma, but not everybody fully understands the math behind it. For example, did you know that the skill points you get for repairing something is completely independent of how damaged it was when you started? It doesn't matter if you started at 80% or 0%. Once you get something back to 100% condition, you get 5 skill points divided by your current skill value in that device's category. And so the most effective way to build skill points is to repair a device as soon as it takes damage. But most devices have a minimum repair threshold, typically 80% which must be surpassed before the repair button even shows up. And while the visual mechanics of the game gradually morph the appearance of a device according to its condition, from this, to this, to this, it's still not an accurate or reliable means of discerning a device's condition by looks alone. So what we want is a way to easily and reliably identify the approximate condition of a device from a distance, and that's not as hard as it sounds. But it's not straightforward either. And just because I like to make things super complicated sometimes, I've chosen to use both color and a blink rate to communicate the state of the device. First of all, while it's tempting to have a system with 100 steps to define every possible condition value, that system would be just as vague as using the visual changes in the device's sprite and therefore undesirable. On the other hand, Having a two-state system isn't enough resolution to objectively improve the efficiency of your maintenance efforts. After some experimentation, I settled on a four-state model. At the bottom end, 0-39% to is considered a critical state and should be addressed immediately. This gets a bright red light and a relatively fast blink rate. 40-59% to is the badly damaged but not life-threatening zone, which is still worrying but not the absolute priority until the critically damaged systems have been dealt with. This gets an orange light with a moderate blink rate. 60-79% to is the sweet spot, just damaged enough to enable repairs for anybody looking to improve their skills, and this gets a yellow light and a very slow blink rate. Finally, we have the 80 to 100% zone, not damaged enough to repair at all, so this region gets a green light that stays solid. So the big takeaways here are that if the device is blinking, it can be repaired, and the faster it's blinking, the more urgently it needs to be repaired. So that's four zones with four colors and four blink rates. Let's build a system that produces these visual effects. For this part, you'll need four Wi-Fi's, three oscillators, three signal check blocks, a memory block, and seven wires. As always, you don't need to lay them out exactly like this, this is just the arrangement that makes the most sense to me. Once you've got the components laid out, it's time to configure them. Define the stored value in the memory block as 0, 0,255, 0, 0,255, aka green, and set the Wi-Fi channels to 2001, 2002, 2003, and 2004. Configure the three oscillators to produce square waves at 2 Hz, 4 Hz, and 6 Hz respectively, and configure the true condition outputs of the signal check blocks to the comma-separated values for yellow, orange, and red, and change all of their target inputs to 1. Copy the true condition outputs for each signal check block over to their respective false condition outputs, changing the last comma separated value in each of them from 255 to 0. This will give the appearance of an off light without actually needing to change the state of the light directly. The wiring here is easy peasy. Wire the signal out of the memory block to the signal in of the first Wi-Fi channel. Then wire the signal out of the first oscillator to the signal in of the nearest signal check block and the signal out of that signal check block to the signal in of the closest Wi-Fi. Repeat these last two connections for the other two rows and boom! We now have our condition indicating visual model generator complete. So that's where the condition indicating signals are coming from. Now let's see where they're headed. For this part and for every device you'll want to add to the system, you'll need two Fi-Fi's, three wires, a light component, and of course the item to be monitored. 
The only configuration required at this stage is to assign a channel to the first Wi-Fi. The actual number is non-specific, but there is a handful of rules that apply to all systems that we connect to our system monitor. First of all, the channel assignment must fall within a continuous integer range with a consistent offset. For example, if you have 12 devices and you want monitored, and the channel offset is 1000, then all the devices that are to be connected must have this Wi-Fi block assigned to a channel within the range of 1000 to 1012. Each channel assignment must be unique, and the channel offset must remain consistent. Let's get this wired so we can move on to the main event. First, wire the condition out of the device you wish to monitor to the signal in of the first Wi-Fi, and wire the signal out of the same Wi-Fi to the set channel of the other Wi-Fi. Then, wire the signal out of the second Wi-Fi to the set color input of the light component, and that's one condition indicator ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, we've arrived at our destination. For this one, you'll need three memory blocks, two Wi-Fi's, two addition blocks, an oscillator, a signal check block, a concatenate block, and a regex block. You'll also want 14 wires to get the job done. The oscillator block is the heartbeat that drives our system, and every tick of the oscillator scans one device's condition and assigns an indicator channel. More devices means more channels to scan, and there's an upper limit to how fast you can go. But for now, we'll start with the pulse type signal at 15 Hz and go up as we need it. That signal check block will limit the number of channels scanned on the network. Configure the target signal as the number of devices you'll be monitoring, and the true condition output is 1. You can configure the memory blocks to have zero value stored in the first block, your channel offset in the second memory block, in this case 1000, and your regex input suffix in the last one. There's our old friend the regex block rearing its ugly head once more. Let's configure our system first, wire the whole thing together, and then we'll come back and take a closer look at the regex. Define the true condition output as the word output, lowercase, and check the box that says use capture groups. Clear the false condition output entirely, and this is where the whole thing can fall apart, so just to make sure there's nothing lost in translation, you can find the actual search expression in the description below. With all of those steps complete, it's time to wire this puppy together. Start by connecting the signal out of the oscillator to the signal in one of the addition block beside it. Then connect the signal out of that addition block to the signal in of the adjacent memory component. Connect the signal out of that memory component to the signal in 2 of the previous addition block, and we now have a tiny circuit that adds 1 to the value stored in the memory block with every pulse of the oscillator. Now connect the signal out of the memory block to the signal in of the signal check block above it, and connect the signal out of the signal check block to the signal in of the previous memory block. If you've configured your blocks correctly, these connections will cause the self-incrementing circuit we just made to reset back to 1 whenever the stored value reaches the number of monitored devices, aka the target signal of the signal check block. Now make another connection to the signal out of that memory block to the signal in 1 of the addition block below it, and connect the signal out of the nearby memory block to the signal in 2 of that same addition block. Connect the signal out of this addition block to the set channel of both Wi-Fi components, and wire the signal out of the left-hand Wi-Fi component to the signal in one of the concatenate block. Connect the signal out of the nearby memory component to signal in two of the concatenate block, and wire the output of the concatenate block to the signal in of the regex component. Finally, connect the signal out of the regex component to the signal in of the Wi-Fi component above it, and you're done. Now, from a purely technical standpoint, some of the things I'm about to explain aren't exactly accurate, such as the order in which the components are updated per frame. But since the end effect will be the same regardless of the programmatic mechanisms, I'd rather use the easier to understand description more than the complicated accurate one. I plan to release another video or two explaining these intricacies in the detail they deserve, but for now I'd like to stick with the description that keeps this assembly accessible to as many people as possible. Now. Enough ranting. Let's see how this thing works. First of all, the signal generator block operates entirely independently from the rest of the system. 
These four channels produce alternating signals at their respective rates and in their respective colors without fail, unaffected by the workings of the rest of this system. Simultaneously, the oscillator in the condition processor starts a new cycle with a single frame pulse output of 1. This is received by one of the input ports of the addition block beside it. It's important to note that in pulse mode, oscillators produce no output signal whatsoever between pulses, and unlike some other blocks which will sustain their last output, math blocks, such as the addition block here, produce no output when one or both inputs receives no input signal. The combination of these rules allows us to build a self-incrementing timer that steps at a controlled rate. When the input signal arrives at the addition block, the second input port is evaluated, and as it is connected to the output value of the adjacent memory block, and this memory block starts with a stored value of 0, that 0 is received by the second input port of the addition block and the calculated result of 1 is broadcast from the addition block's output port. This overwrites the stored value of the memory block, which is in turn broadcast from the memory block signal output. This has two effects. First, it triggers the signal block above it to compare the input signal to its specified target signal, and two, this new value is received by the input port of the addition block below it. Since, in this example, the value of 1 is not equal to the signal check block's target signal, that block does nothing, and the second addition block sums the new input with the value being received from its adjacent memory block. This value is the Wi-Fi channel offset, which, when summed with a device number, results in the Wi-Fi channel corresponding to the first device, or more specifically, the device whose first Wi-Fi component is configured to the channel equal to the sum of the device number and the Wi-Fi channel offset. This channel number is received by the set channel port of both of these Wi-Fi components, which changes their respective operating channels, and the value of the condition out signal being received by the remote Wi-Fi component on the same channel becomes the output of the left-hand Wi-Fi component in the component processor. This value is concatenated with the regex input suffix provided from the memory block adjacent here, and the combined string is passed into the regex block and compared to the search expression. If any, the search expression identifies which search criteria are satisfied by the input string, and returns the appropriate formatted output string. This string, by design, will be one of the four channels used by the signal generator, and this channel value is broadcast from the regex block and received by the signal input of the right-hand Wi-Fi channel, which transmits this value back to the remote Wi-Fi block on the same channel. The remote Wi-Fi component broadcasts the received generator channel from its signal output, which is received by the set channel of the next Wi-Fi block. Switching this Wi-Fi component to this channel causes it to receive the color signal from the corresponding signal generator group, and this color value is passed from the Wi-Fi signal signal output to the set color input of the connected light component. This cycle repeats itself with every pulse from the oscillator, incrementing through the device numbers until it reaches the value stored as the target signal of the signal check block, at which point the signal check block replaces the stored value in the memory block with its true output, 1, starting the cycle over again. This is why it's crucially important that you keep this value updated with the accurate number of devices to be monitored. If this number is too large, the indicators won't be as updated as fast as they could be, and if it's too small, there will be devices that go completely unmonitored. And that is how it works. As promised, let's go back and review the regex. The first important element is the input suffix. This string is concatenated to the condition value, and is used by the search engine to determine its output. There are three major takeaways to notice about the input suffix. First, the input value always comes first and will be on the left. Second, the components are all separated by octothorps. And third, the values 2001 through 2004 all correspond to the Wi-Fi channels used by our signal generator. So the channel values and the order that they appear in are both important. Now let's take a look at the search expression. Let's peel apart these layers of parentheses first. This first layer is a monster of a search expression which must include the first character when searching and must end with the first octothorpe. This prevents the search expression from being applied more than once to the condition value. For example, preventing the input value of 62 from being further evaluated separately as 6 and 2. The next layer isolates the condition value from that octothorpe, and the layer after that defines four conditions, any one of which could satisfy the search. The logic of accepting one or more matching inputs is defined with the pipe symbol. The first search sub-expression actually has two conditions inside, again indicated by the pipe symbol. 
Remembering that the input to this regex process is guaranteed to be a numeric value between 0 and 140. The first expression will return true if the input is a three digit value starting with 1, the second digit being any number from 0 to 4, and then any digit after that. The second part of the sub-expression accepts any two digit number starting with the digit 8 or 9. Altogether, the combined search expression returns true if the number input is anywhere from 80 to 140. The search expressions that follow are very similar, the next expression being satisfied by any two-digit number starting with a 6 or a 7, aka 60 to 79, and the one after that being any two-digit number starting with a 4 or a 5, aka 40 to 59. The last search expression has a twist. There's a question mark after the definition of the subset that includes the digits 1 through 3, which means that this sub-expression is satisfied by any two-digit number starting with a 1, 2, or 3, as well as being satisfied by any single digit number. This little blurb is remarkably functional. Remember that the first Octothorpe is already accounted for. This sub-expression starts with a subset prefixed with a caret, meaning that it's actually satisfied by any character except the ones found in the square brackets. This is followed by a plus sign, which expands our search expression to be one or more characters that are anything but an Octothorpe, and this plus sign is followed with an octothorpe, and the whole kit is followed with an asterisk question mark combo. In plain English, that turns this expression into any number of sets of non-octothorpe characters followed by an octothorpe. Recalling our input suffix, this splits the outputs into the values 2001, 2002, 2003, and 2004, which will be important in the last section. The combination of a question mark and character string enclosed in angle brackets creates what's called a named capture group. In this case, the capture group can be later referenced with the string output. Now let's split this up again by parentheses. Remember, regular expressions are designed for either true-false tests or hunting for substrings. They're not really well suited for if-then conditional outputs, save for this technique. The question marks at the beginning of each group coupled with round brackets and a number inside only applies the search expression that follows if the index search element was also matched. And what do I mean by the index search element? Let's go back to the first set of parentheses. This is called the first capture group because it's in the first set of parentheses. Nested groups are prioritized before consecutive groups, so we look inside the first set of parentheses for the next group. This group is the same as the first, excluding the first octothorpe, so this would be called the second capture group. Looking inside, we see four more capture groups separated with pipes. The first one of these four would be called the third capture group, the second the fourth capture group, etc, etc. Now, going back to our output groups, the index sub-expressions are starting to make sense. So if the third capture group was satisfied, and the substring 2001 is found within any of those input suffix groups, then the substring 2001 is assigned to the capture group named output. This same technique applies to the other indexed capture groups, and by design, only one of these groups can be satisfied. See? Not exactly straightforward, but certainly not a dark magic either. I hope you find this circuit helpful. I think it has the potential to improve a lot of players' quality of life significantly. But if you have questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to share them below. And guys, the vast majority of you are watching my videos without subscribing. I know this is probably something you hear a thousand times a day, but if you find this video informative, amusing, or narrated by a handsome, talented individual, please consider subscribing and mash that tiny bell to get push notifications the next time I drop another knowledge bomb from the gaming nerd. Happy diving!